Hello, welcome everybody to our third uh, webinar in our partner ecosystems uh, webinar series. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, so in the first two webinars, we presented partner ecosystems challenges for vendors and partners and partner ecosystems building a roadmap. We laid out the foundation for why it is necessary to build a strong channel and the six areas to focus on in that process. In this third episode, we'll start looking at how you devise a strategy that will allow, allow you to create a framework for a strong partner channel ecosystem. So uh, my name's Aaron Solomon, as you saw on the slide, I will be moderating today. I'm the Director of Operations here at Gorilla. I've worked with and, and managed many channel sales and marketing programs for a variety of vendors and, and work directly with partners um, on channel sales and marketing best practices. So joining us for our discussion today are Jill Esposito. Jill has worked in the channel uh, partnerships and alliances for more than 20 years. He's worked for distributors, vendors, and partners, and he brings a 360 degree view uh, to the conversation on partner ecosystems. Uh, we'll also be joined by Carlo Breda, and Carlo has spent nearly three decades in the channel. He's passionate about partnerships and, and how organizations can optimize the power of their partner ecosystems. So uh, strap in, we're gonna have a great discussion today. So, um, Jill, Carlo, how are we? Doing good. Yeah, really happy to be on uh, on this uh, show. Thank you, Aaron. Great. Happy to be there as well. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, third one and uh, crossing fingers. So far, we have quite a bit of attendees. So love it. Yeah, this is great. So um, we've got a couple questions to consider today. But, um, you know, I, I think let's just start with why do you need to start with a strategy? Um, you know, so, so Jill, um, you know, in your with your 360 degree view of everything, uh, let's dive into why you need to start with a strategy. Well, that's uh, uh, um, the word I think for most is uh, self-explanatory, right? I mean, it's uh, it's I'm gonna do what I've done in the past and uh, re-explain my, or represent my very, very simple view as what is a strategy and why do you need it, right? Strategy is, is defining and those are two elements of a strategy that you need to have to have a sound strategy. There's more than that, but those are the, the starter points. It's to define one thing. It's the current state of your organization. Where are you at today, right? And you have to do this in a very honest way. We're not talking about, you know, uh, fluff here. It's like, what are you doing today? So generally, this can be also supplemented by your mission, what it is that you're here for. What are you doing today? And what are your capabilities today and so on and so forth. And then there's the second element, which is uh, what where it becomes more strategic is to define where is it that you want to be tomorrow. And that's really important to define this very clearly, uh, not only in terms of capabilities, but also in terms of, you know, numbers and, and whatnot. What, what is it that you aspire to become? So part of this is your vision as a company. But there's other elements, more tactical elements, more precise elements, more uh, tangible elements, such as, you know, what revenue you plan to achieve, what um, how many partners you plan to get, what geos you plan to develop in, and so on and so forth. And the strategy in itself is how are you going to connect the first one to the second one, right? How are you going to get from point A, which is your current state, to point B, which is your desired state? And usually this, this uh, you're going to do this at one year, three year, five year, whatever, you know, different stages you want to establish this. And the other important element that I would add to this is that a strategy, when it's defined, when it's initially defined, is not static, right? It is something that is going to evolve and uh, that you're going to be looking at. Uh, regularly and measure against the KPIs you will have put in place to see how you're progressing against your desired outcomes and what it is that you need to do to tweak and to uh, uh, to adapt or even to completely change if at some point you decide that the initial strategy or some of the element of the initial strategies were not right uh, or that because of the new product or services your company is launching, you need to take a different route, attack different geos, 
and so on and so forth. Select a different topology of partners, whatever the case might be, right? So that, in a nutshell, that's it. Carlo, anything to say about this? Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, I would. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, you make some really, really great points there, Gilles. I would say one of the most important things um, as to why, certainly as to why you need a strategy, is to have uh, internal alignment in the uh, in the company, um, because uh, the strategy is something that is uh, really accepted, you know, not only by the channel organization uh, but but by the company overall, and it creates a certain that that level of buy-in um, that all of the other uh, divisions, departments, and um, uh, leadership heads need need to need to be on the same line. Absolutely, and I think uh, more than anything, also it's really important for the strategy to be uh, to be developed as uh, as a um, as a next step really after the um, company's uh, uh, purpose mission vision and values have been determined um, you know the company strategy overall but uh, the channel strategy needs to be true to that um, it must it must be something that really needs to live and breathe the company values, the mission, and everything else. And all of those values need to be implemented into the partner strategy. Uh, the mission and the purpose need to be properly implemented into the partner strategy. And then once once you have that, let's say, I don't know how to call it, maybe it's the, the ethical framework. Once you have a very, very clear ethical framework that is actually bought in by all the C-level management in the company, then 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 I would say is, is a good time to actually look at um, where, where you want the channel business to go, um, how you want the channel business to uh, live with uh, or, um, or in conjunction or not with the, with the direct sales organization, um, what kind of financial objectives um, it should have and how it should get resourced. So all of, these, um, uh, all of those additional thoughts uh, are absolutely critical in, in a channel strategy. Um, but I think that the that, that an important point I'd like to make is that the ethical framework, the ethical uh, framework for the setup of the channel strategy really comes from the company's uh, purpose, mission and vision. Yeah, that's great. And and so you both mentioned, you know, KPIs and objectives in, you know, in why you need a channel strategy. So. After you have buy-in from, from the executives and the sales team and you're ready to put together your channel strategy, so where, you know, where would you get or how do you start to frame those initial objectives and prioritize, you know, prioritize your objectives and, and then start to build KPIs on top of that? Uh, so let me jump in. Uh, one of the things that uh, oh, I've done successfully in the past and I've seen other folks do very successfully is really to look at uh, uh, in terms of where, where you want to go, um, in terms of, you know, de developing, you know, what kind of KPIs you want to have for your channel organization. You really need to have these very clear objectives as to um, what, uh, for, first of all, derived from the product market fit. What is your market? You know, what is your not only your addressable market, but your serviceable addressable market. And that's really the market that you can capture. And you can capture a percentage of that. It can be a small percentage or a big percentage if you're bold. Or your strategy might be to dominate it, you know, monopolistically in the future. I mean, the, the point is having that clear vision. And so in order to de define uh, what that market is as a result of the product market fits, as a result of the analysis of what is a serviceable addressable market, then what I have found works really well is uh, a system called uh, battlefield development. And um, it's actually simple enough. It's uh, the idea is, uh, is to define your, your battlefield uh, and where you're going to be uh, operating and where you're not going to be operating. That's also important. It's as important as, uh, you know, it's clear, it's very important to know where you're not going to go from, from the outset. <clears throat> now, one of the things that you do in battlefield development is you determine uh, what are the verticals that have the right product market fit. Then you got to take it to the next level because each vertical has a number of sub verticals and those really need to be considered. So for example, a lot of companies, they say, well, you know what? We feel that we should go for finance and banking and manufacturing. Uh, well, actually the dynamics of these markets are very different. Manufacturing 
is so vast horizontally. A lot of people call it a diagonal rather than a vertical because it's made up of so many different things. It's discrete manufacturing, process manufacturing, all kinds of nuts and bolts manufacturing, manufacturing of battle tanks. I mean, it's vast. And the, the sales motions are so incredibly different, right? So a proper battlefield takes that uh, takes that in a very granular way and then looks at the, at, at the um, growth rates for each of these markets. Because you might have a product market fit that's really good for healthcare, <laughs> but maybe the healthcare market in your with your solution is not growing as fast as you know something adjacent so you should be putting your your investment in in the fastest growing vertical market that is appropriate for you right and then the third thing uh, which is i think very strategic uh, all this uh, battlefield development because it really tells you where to, where to go the third thing is uh determining which companies sit within these high growth rate verticals that you want to go for right and have those spelled out you know pull the names of the companies out on an excel spreadsheet have a very clear idea of who sits in that cell within that vertical and that growth rate that you're interested in then then you can start looking at where they are geographically and then you can see you can look at uh well you can also look at of their um uh it spend what proportion of the it spend you can have for your solution and then, and then actually look at uh, uh, at um, uh, both from a geographical perspective and a partner coverage perspective, where are they and what partners should cover them. Um, and I think that's a very good place to start with your channel strategy, in my opinion. Um, and, and then all the all the discussion about the metrics, I think we should have it and we can have it in the course of this uh, webinar. But it really, th I think that's a very strong starting point. That's uh, just uh, throwing it out there as an opinion. It's not often done, but it's worth doing. Jill? Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd like to go back to the initial question and bridging into this one a little bit more because um, uh, I, I think there's a lot more to it. And, and we're talking today specifically about a channel strategy or a partnership strategy, right? And and there's a, there's a certain element. So I, I gave a few components, right, which are defining a clear mission, what it is that you're doing today and your your current capabilities, that is extremely important to know where you're at, honestly, in the company. And uh, as one of the one of the attendees mentioned, you know, make uh, a difficult choice, but early, right? And to say now, we're, we're, we're definitely not ready to go there. So let, let's not put this as a goal for now, at least, and so on and so forth. Very often I see strategies that are, um, uh, overall strategy, especially around channels uh, that are delusional. Uh, and I, yeah, I would definitely call that delusional, right? Uh, especially when they're uh, inscribed into a time frame that is way too short to achieve goals for which the company doesn't have any capability at this point, especially when in the setup of the strategy, the company hasn't been thinking about things like capacity planning, about you know their internal organization, including the budgeting and the staffing of those things and all that, and and pretty much they hope for the best, and uh, and it doesn't happen, or the actual achievement against the initial delusional goals is a small fraction of what they were hoping to achieve. So uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's Mark that said that. Thank you, Mark, for mentioning this. You know, very early on. You have to be you have to be humble a little bit at the beginning, you know, especially if you're a startup or a scale up company, uh, you're not going to have endless buckets and all that. But I, I, I see very good strategy being defined by very large company that have heavy capabilities when it comes to investing and this type of thing. And they realize that there are some things uh, when you're going to develop all the tactics uh, and to achieve your vision or to try to come as close as possible to your vision and your your big goals. Um, they know there are some elements that are uncompressible and, and that you're going to have to deal with. And no matter how much money you throw at it, it's not going to be enough, right? So being realistic in what you're going to be doing is something important. One thing that Carol mentioned that is also equally important is to involve the element of culture in the company. And I, I'm, I'm going to make a very big difference between two elements here. I'm not talking about the values. I've seen numerous plan on designing strategy that includes values. Personally, I don't believe in values. Uh, it's it's I can name you know 
50 companies that are going to say integrity, accountability, diversity, innovation, leadership, all that kind of stuff. These are empty words as far as I'm concerned. And, and putting them in a strategy doesn't, for me, represent anything tangible that you're going to be able to execute on. I assume uh, when I go in a company that everybody's ethical, right? I assume that diversity is embraced. I assume that people are uh, of a high level of integrity and so on and so forth. So, But the cultural aspect that I talk about is making sure that as opposed to what we commonly see from a channel perspective or from a partnership perspective, this strategy specific to the channel is not isolated to the channel team or to the channel or organization. Uh, and that's very often a problem. I keep saying over and over again that developing a good ecosystem of partners is it takes the whole village. Uh, not only sales, marketing, but it takes the C-suite, it takes product, it takes product marketing, design, engineering. All of this is implied in this. And if the message doesn't come from the top to say, we are intent on delivering on this strategic plan that we have to create a or multiple successful ecosystems, you're going to start having this silo system again, this silo situation, uh, which is not conducive to a good to the good development of a partner ecosystem. So that that's that's a point where I think it's really important. You're not going to see this in a strategic plan usually, but it's really important that it, it's taking into account. And then uh, and then you start getting into the granularity of things. Yeah. Where well, you have your your current state and you know clearly, honestly, what your current capabilities are. And you have your desired state, let's say at one year, three or five years. Uh, you're going to have to define a little bit more things. And Carlo mentioned some of them, right? Uh, understanding your market very clearly, right? There's a lot of things because the, the next steps after strategy is to start decking your ecosystem with partners, right? So identifying the partners and this and that. And when you're going to start talking to these partners, they're going to want to understand what your plan is. And they're going to need a few more things than just understanding your plan, making sure it's aligned with was them and their plans. So therefore, you have to have a good understanding when you're going to start defining which partners I need to have to be able to be successful in, in this strategic plan and my goals. You're going to have to make sure that you understand their own strategy and what do they aspire to do, what do they aspire to be in also one year, three year, five years, this type of thing, and align with this as much as possible, right? Um, but there's there's many other elements you're going to have to to look at uh, beside the topology of your partner, like your product and the pricing of your product and what is going to be the compensation for your partners, right? At the point of sale, but also at the point of value, right? Uh, we talked about that last time. There's a ton of uh, uh, there's a ton of companies that today still do business the same way, thinking you know we're just going to give you ten or twenty or thirty percent every time you sell something. And for them, that's the entire compensation plan. Well, things are evolving, and uh, and partners are getting picky, as I mentioned. It's uh, the 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 deck is completely reversed in the sense that now partners choose their vendors more so that vendors choose their partners. And I will debate this with anyone any day, uh, and 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 support it with very good example. But you start seeing the development of. How do I make partner engage and interested and all that? Not only in how much percentage you're going to pass, right? We had a discussion on another seminar this morning, webinar this morning about that, right? And say, well, if Dell gives me 12% and HP gives me 10%, then I'm going to go and sell Dell. Well, that's that's not as simple as that, unfortunately, or fortunately, actually. It's, uh, it's more important now to see all the things you can bring to the table to contribute to the strategy of your partners. So what are you going to do for them, right? And all this has to fit into your strategy. When you're going to try to tie current state to desired states, you're going to have to line up a lot of tactics and a lot of things that you're going to put in place. And when it comes to a partner strategy, this can be a fairly long list of things, right? Which we tend to call channel readiness uh and involves all the elements i mentioned originally plus you know many other things such as your tools your what is going to be your distribution strategy are you going to work with direct vars 
or are you going to leverage the capabilities of a, of a distributor? If you leverage the capabilities of a distributor, when are you going to do so? And how much is it going to cost you? Because they're not going to do it for free, obviously, uh, and so on and so forth. When you're going to design your partner program, if you want to design a partner program, are you going to use tiers or are you not going to use tiers? Are you going to have a referral program, right? How are you going to communicate all of this internally and externally? How are you going to deck the sales team of your partners with the tools they need to be able to promote and, and sell your solutions uh, efficiently, right? And so on and so forth. And every time you're going to design one of the things, uh, you're going to naturally derive some KPIs that will help you manage your ecosystem later, but also measure whether or not your strategy is working according to plan, right? Pretty much. So it's, it's, it's complex. Yeah, it's uh, um, it is complex, and I, I love everything you said there. And uh, so there's really so much to say on this subject uh, that um, you know you can hardly fit it in uh, in uh, many many of these sessions. But uh, what I wanted to say is uh, I just wanted to pick up on on the hard conversations. I, li I like that. I think it's important to have that sense of realism. It's important to have to know that hard conversations are part of the fabric of of having a channel, building a channel, and and living with a channel and growing a channel. And hard conversations is, are something that need, need to be had internally so that your peers and your management and the overall company leadership um, is in line with you. But also hard conversations need to be had with partners, not once, twice, but all the time, right? Now, this is something that I think is super important is a hard conversations because a lot of people will say, will no, know that and they say, well, uh, they go and sit down at the table with a partner and they say, well, look, this is the situation. So, you know, take it or leave it. <laughs> but that's not the solution. That's not the answer, right? It's not about, um, you know, authenticity is not the same as brutality, right? So whilst when you're defining a channel strategy, at, at, at the, the point of defining the strategy, all you need really is business acumen and you can be, you know, very hard-nosed about it. When you go and implement the channel, it's about soft skills. So you need to account for that uh, early on. Um, because soft skills are necessary. So you can be authentic and you can have a fierce conversation with a partner, uh, but you can do that uh, in, in, a, in a compassionate manner um, where you really show that you're there at the table to make that joint success together. And the, the same applies internally. So one of the best books I've ever read, which I strongly recommend to anyone, is uh, called Fierce Conversations. I read it like a million years ago when I was a kid, like probably a 35 years ago, 40 years ago, something like that. And it was just a phenomenal book and it changed my life. And um, uh, and it really is about, about how, how do you go about having, you know, having the conversations that are difficult to have. Because I think that most of the partnerships and, and you know, channel relationships fall apart because one or both sides is unable to approach the conversation fiercely, in other words, authentically and compassionately. Um, so I'll just pause there and then uh, I, I want to talk a lot about um, ecosystems and defining the strategy in the context of the ecosystem. Um, so what, what you said, Carlo, is interesting. I think it applies, it, it applies far more internally than it applies externally. One of the, one of the remarks and one of the observation I've, uh, I have of uh, the past two decades of working channels or other form of partnerships and alliances is the fact that people involved in, in this particular field usually spend more time battling inside than they do outside, right? There is a, uh, uh, most partners understand that the connector, whether you call it a, a channel manager or a, a PAM or whatever, right? Um, are usually fairly well aligned and understand the need to be fairly well aligned and understanding their partners, right? And for the ones that do their job well, uh, they usually have the, the most important ingredient there is, which is the trust uh, of, of their partners. And the trust of their partners, something I've observed, is usually granted to the person that manages them, not the organization this person is working for, the person that manages them. And that reflects the fact that there is a lack of alignment and a lack of culture supporting partner ecosystem within the organization <clears throat> often. I'm not saying 100% of the time, but often, 
there's, you know, the, the, if you ask partner, what are their, their number one competitor, they will probably 50% of the time tell you it's so-and-so another, you know, VAR, another partner out there. And the other 50% of the time, they will tell you it's the direct sales team of the vendors I represent, right? So the trust is not is not there with the company. It is usually with a partner or organization. And that is, from a cultural standpoint, a failure, right? It should be with the entire organization that support them. It should be they believe in the program. They tr trust is the most important thing, right, at this point. Uh, <clears throat> and so I uh, agree with what you're saying, Carlo, but in the sense that those difficult discussions that you need to have uh, are going to be very often internal to your organization as a member of a channel team or a partner team, more so than they're going to be external. That's what I believe. No, that's a, that's a, that's a fair point, Jill. I, I totally agree. Uh, got a, uh, go ahead, Aaron. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, we got a, uh, a nice question uh, from in the comments uh, from uh, saying, how important is taking each partner perspective into account in your entire ecosystem approach? So, so that, that I, I, yeah. I think that's a very good question. It's yeah. uh, it, it's ideal to do it this way, uh, but you have to balance the act with the scalability of your program, right? Uh, if you were to if you were to do it in a perfectly ideal world and you had unlimited time and resources to do it, every single partner you deal with would have a different partner program in front of them, right? That completely reflects and matches. Their, their desire, their perspective, their goals, their strategy, where is it that they want to go and so on and so forth. But you, you cannot do that, right? However, you can have those discussions with each and every partner. And I, I really encourage, you know, especially the new channel managers that are coming on the market and all that to, to you know, I've, I've, I've seen, and, and you guys know that because you work with me when I was at Ordeto, for example, right, uh, on, it, I've seen something terrible in this company is that every time they would present to anybody, customers, prospects, partners, uh, out of one hour meeting that we had, they would take all the time just to present a deck of 20 plus slides to talk about themselves, right? I, I strongly recommend against it, right? There's the way for the partner to ask you the questions about this and all that, right? But make sure to go in the, in, in, in the intent of the question that you do ask about themselves, right? First of all, it's flattering, so it's never a bad thing to do that. Second of all, it will really help you understand how is it that you're going to handle that particular partner, where are you going to go with them, and so on and so forth. You need to understand where they're going. And that's, and I'm talking about any VAR for that. But as you get into the world of what we call strategic partnerships, right, then you need to really, really understand what it is that you're, you're not going to deal with, a, 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 with a, a, a VAR in a geo that covers one state or a region in Europe or something like this, the same way you're going to deal with AWS or Microsoft or Google, right? It's, a, it's vastly different. And within those larger partnerships and all that, you're going to need to understand very clearly what is their own strategy, what it is that they're trying to do and all that, right? Uh, a good example is like the, the latest uh, Microsoft Alliance I put in place, uh, understanding that Microsoft didn't want a dime of what they would help me resell out of my company. They didn't take anything. They didn't want that. But they expected me to understand their strategy and what it is that they were trying to achieve through this partnership and that I was actually a door opener for them to help them access something because their target is not to make money out of the resale of your product. They don't do that. Their target was to generate, you know, um, uh, cloud consumption from those new customers that we would get together, and so on and so forth. And that's a tiny example of what it is that there is a need to understand. So, each partner perspective is important, right? Are you going to be able to address all of them? No, because you need to have an element of scalability, and you need to to be able to have a one to many approach when you have a partner program, right? Uh, when you have a product program that scales and is based on pure resale and this type of thing, it's important to have a one-to-many approach. As you get into specific, you know, strategic partnerships, then it's different. Then absolutely, you must take each partner perspective and the angle is different. And this is why in organizations that are successful, 
usually the team or the person that is going to be managing, uh, I don't know, Deloitte is not going to be the same person that is going to be managing, you know, Microsoft or AWS or IBM and all that, because those, those can be game changers, uh, especially for small companies, right? And if you don't have like a specific team dedicated to understanding clearly what's going on with these guys and how to best align with them, you're not going to go very far. That's my guess. I couldn't agree more um, with uh, with uh, what, what you're saying there. I, I think um, with regards to, um, uh, I, I, I think you really need to understand the partners uh, and uh, understanding their perspectives is is fundamental. In fact, it's it's the number one most important thing to do um, in a partner relationship is uh, knowing them and understanding what they need in order to make their company successful and what the individual needs to make his job and you know, his profession successful. Um, usually the things are aligned, uh, but there are nuances and you need to understand them. And it's really, it really pays off um, if you can do that. Now, one of the ways that we do it um, with uh, our clients at Gorilla is that we, we do a lot of partner scorecarding. And partner scorecarding enables us to record uh, the, um, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of the finer details of uh, what is, uh, you know, what's important to a partner. Um, and then it's really important to engage them based on what's important to a partner. Also, I think I'm, I'm a believer in, in the fact that people are generally good and I'm a believer in good karma, right? So I think when you approach the actual implementation of the partner relationship, you always want to, um, you want to really empathize and, and, um, and try to do as much as what you, you, what you understand it, what you understand is going to be good for the partner. The more of that you do, the more I feel you will uh, get in return. You shouldn't do it because of the return. You should do it because you want to be a good person on the planet. But that will inevitably create um, a sense of um, friendship, a sense of loyalty, a sense of trust, um, uh, and uh, and that will build up on the relationship. So yeah, understanding the partner's perspective, and appreciating it, and and learning from it, and adapting your strategy. Like Jules said at the beginning, the strategy is not a document you do at the beginning of the three-year period and then you put it in, uh, in, the, in, in, in the drawer. No, it's a live document. So it needs to be constantly adjusted. And, and also when you do your forecasts, they need to be constantly readjusted. The strategy will change. If you, you may decide that you go with a different set of partners, that you augment the number of partners, that you work with uh, in, in a different way, that you incentivize them differently, that you resource your partner um, organization differently. All of this are changes in strategy and they have to occur all the time. So the partner strategy document is is absolutely live. Um, yeah, I'll pause there. So, so yeah, um, about two things about what you said, Carlo. One about the, the I'll, I'll go from the last first, which is about the things that are evolving in a partner strategy and all that. And, and, and there, there's two sets of elements. There's the uh, elements you can, in theory, control. So everything you're, that is an output of your company, right? Um, what kind of product you design? Is it red? Is it green? Is it, you know, whatever, what the pricing, those type of thing and all that. And there's also all the elements you do not control that are going to send you back to your strategy to redesign it. And those are usually what your competitors are doing. You, you don't control that. Right. And they may, they may come up to your partner who is whom you compete with something that is so much more sexy, so much more appealing to them, you know, a better approach to things, better compensation, better incentives, whatever the case might be. And you have to adapt to that. And you're not going to be knowledgeable about this till it's too late unless you have this communication and this empathy with your partners to talk about things. Right. And I'm not talking about talk, talking to the CEO of your partners. I'm talking all the way down to the sales guys and all that because they're the ones that are going to carry in the bag and, and this type of things, right? For a, a channel thing. And by the way, when I mentioned competition in channels uh, and in traditional resale channels, I'm not talking about if you're in storage and your company XYZ, the EMCs of the world and all that kind of, I'm not talking about your direct competitor that sell the same thing. Your competitors in a partnership environment is everybody that is on the line card of that partner, everybody, because your currency is Mindshare. And if they spend, you're selling storage, for example, or you're selling cybersecurity, and they spend more time selling networking or that kind of stuff, you're not competing with a networking company. 
but in this case you are right because all the time they spend with the guys in networking the vendors they have in networking is time they're not going to spend with you so it's your direct competitors plus everybody else on the line core right that is there so that's the one thing i wanted to add to that this is really important that coming that constant communication to understand and i've designed oomph uh, a certain amount of, of partner programs uh, at the beginning in a bubble, right? Working with people in the company and say, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, inspiring ourselves from other vendor programs and that kind of stuff. And then about eight years ago, I stopped doing this, right? And instead of doing this, I went to the partners that I, that I had already a relationship with and all that, and I asked them to craft the partner program for me, to say, what would be the ideal partner program? And I used to do this with 10 to 15 and out of this, I could extract something. And this partner program had to be revised all the time because my competitors, aka every other vendor represented by that partner, would come up with new ideas and new things and all that. And we would have to take the best of breed. Yeah, why reinvent the wheel? No, we would take the best ideas, the one that pleased the most that particular partner or a set of particular partners, and adapt our program to do that. So that's one thing. The other thing I really want to say that, Carl, is like, I don't think understanding, knowing your partner is number one. I think it's number two. Number one, <laughs> number one is knowing a combination of your capabilities and the market. That's really, really important because partners don't have the time to do that for you. You know, they're, 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 I mean, they may come back and say, you're completely deluded. It's very different than, than what you believe it is. And I've seen this very recently, but you need to be, they look at you as a vendor, Partners are going to look at you as the expert in your field. And if you're the expert in your field and you do not understand your market, who's playing in it, what are the trends, where is it going, and so on and so forth, they're not going to be to have a very educated discussion when they're going to be in front of prospects and their customers, right? And the last thing salespeople want to do, just so you know, and I'm sure you all know that, is look stupid in front of their customers or their prospects. And therefore, if you feed them no information and they don't have time to go get that information, or if you feed them shitty information and they don't want to look stupid, when they'll be in front of their prospect and customers, they will not talk about you. As simple as that. They have many other lines, again, of product that they can talk about. So knowing your capabilities, your differentiator, and what the market is, not looks like, is knowing your time knowing where it's going, knowing what the future yields and those type of thing or having a good ID, you know, is number one for me. It's you really need to know your stuff before you go bother some partners, right? So, so Jill, you mentioned, um, you know, knowing your capabilities, right? So uh, kind of ties into a comment that we have uh, or a question in the comments is, should strategies include partners of all sizes? or focus on building relationships with larger distributors. Um, so so I, I guess maybe Jill, Jill or Carlo, um, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you if you want. Yeah, I'd like Jill to start with uh, that. Okay. You so, have a pretty hands-on distribution experience too. So right. Carlo mentioned something earlier is that, you know, as you're going to define your strategy, I, I've seen strategies that were based on geos. Or I've seen strategies that were based on size of companies. I've seen strategies that were based on verticals and all that. And I've seen a lot of strategies that were a mix of all these things, right, in terms of the end customer. I've seen partners that were very large catering to a lot of small customers. And I've seen very small partners catering to absolutely gigantic corporation, right? Uh, and there were five people operation teams. Uh, I have one in Chicago. Uh, at the time I was with Itachi, I had one in Chicago, five people operation, all the business flowing into a specific uh, pharma company based out of Chicago as well, was going through them, right? So it's a small partner. You want to have this partner if you're targeting this vertical and you want to target the top 50 companies in that vertical. Absolutely, right? You need to know that. And you'll find out when you go talk to Abbott Labs, they will tell you, we do well our business with so-and-so. And then realize it's not a CDW, it's not a serious computer solution, it's not a worldwide technology. It's a five-person family operation that, that at that time used to manage this. So 
defining what size of partner you're going to want and that kind of stuff is dependent on so many other variables that you need to know and that you will learn over time, right? When you try to do business with them, it's, it's a very tricky question to, uh, uh, to answer, right? Having metrics in place that says, oh, we only want partner that are nationals or we only want partner that are going to be at least so many people or this, this and that. I don't see the best line to define this, right? Uh, usually there's going to be other factor, decision factor. And this is something, for example, a company like Gorilla does. And I like that. That's why I contracted with them twice in different roles uh, to be able to scorecard partners based on set of variables you as a vendor are going to define initially. And then you will revisit them, I guarantee you. But you will define initially. And then they can scorecard based on that because they have all the intelligence to go and, and, and find this information and see you know, who fits the bill. Right. When it comes to uh, uh, the other part of the question is when it comes to uh, building a relationship with a distributor. Well, I've spent eight years at one of the largest one. And I, for one, see the value of a distributor on many, many, many different fronts. And I'm not talking about the peak pack and ship and the inventory stuff and all that. Right. Uh, I'm talking about their ability to canvas and, and to bring to the table partners they already have in the hundreds and all that. They can do that. They, they can definitely be a, a tremendous asset, but you're going to need to have somebody in your organization that understand how distributors are working because now distributor, they're, they're, they're not like they used to be 30 years ago where they would take any vendor because for them, it's a, it's a number game, right? It's a math game where they need to add stuff. They make so little margin that they need volume. And at the time they would privilege everybody that could bring in you know, a vendor that, that could bring in 50 POs a week, right? If you were a startup going to knock on the door of a Tech Data or Avnet at the time or Arrow or Cinex or these guys, they would apologize politely and say, come back when you have, you know, at least so many partners and this and that, and you can bring them to my thread. Uh, it's different today. Today, they, 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 they cater to small companies and they have programs in place to help you grow your business. Right, you're not going to have a full team of dedicated players at the distributor to take care of your business every day, for sure. Not at the beginning, but they have program and they can definitely help you get there. But distributors today, when you're going to come to them and knock on the door on that thing I mentioned originally, that channel readiness where you have everything aligned that the, the their partners are going to need to be able to do the job, they are they are very strict on that, and you're going to have to be very very ready before you go talk to a distributor, right? So that, that's to answer this uh, particular question. And, and uh, just to add a little bit more, <clears throat> more color and complexity to that, I just wanted to tag on the, the, the general concept of partner ecosystems, right? And, and, you know, so when you set about your partner strategy, um, what's really important is that you look at what kind of ecosystem you're actually going to need. Now, depending on the type of uh, SaaS solution or technology or infrastructure solution that you have, you're not going to need just a reselling partner. You, you're going to need a variety of partners. You're probably going to need partners that are implementing partners, partners that are referral partners, partners that are um, transactional partners, and partners that are consultative partners. Uh, and you may want, on top of that, uh, uh, you might want to look at distribution. You might want to look at uh, <coughs> system integrators and the globals, the nationals, and the regionals. I mean, you might also, and, and this is what you know, analysts uh, like Forrester uh, are saying now, and it's been said for the last 20 years. <clears throat> now, uh, design agencies are becoming partners. Um, bankers are becoming partners, consultants, accountants. Depending on the line of business that you're in, it's the, the insurance insurance companies. companies. Insurance companies. The market's exploded, right? So what was once upon a time a world where by there were probably 250,000 real partners and maybe an extended up to 700,000. Now is a world where there are probably about three to four million potential partners. Now that's really spreading it real wide. And maybe not everybody spreads it that wide and it's not necessary. We, we're even talking about, frankly, TikTok influencers and, and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. All of that matters and it's going to matter more and more. The question is, when you set your strategy, you want to you want to broaden your outlook. It's not just about reselling partners. How are you gonna How are you gonna treat your referral partners? Jill made a great point. Small company in Chicago that sells to a huge pharmaceutical company. 
a five person VAR is something that most vendors will completely sniff, uh, you know, they'll say no. They'll say, yeah, well, we don't want companies that are so small. And that may be a really big mistake, all right? Mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you another one. I had hands-on experience of a company in England, a, a farmhouse in the middle of something shire, right? With like two men and a dog, and they were, did like uh, dozens of millions of dollars for IBM software. And everybody was astonished. And who are who is this partner? Well, they're just two very well connected people and the dog, and nothing to be sniffed at. Absolutely. And and uh, so therefore, how do you treat them? Because of course they didn't have the implementation skills. They didn't have a sales engineering team, so they couldn't be treated as normal partners. They were referral partners. But what power comes from that kind of relationship? So therefore, um, what I would say is, uh, when when you set out to to define your strategy really look at all the different kinds of partners that you'd want into the ecosystem and then do a channel um, capacity mapping. How many of each kind do you need in order to meet your objectives? And then the geographical consideration is where do you want them? And I, I noticed there was a, a comment earlier from Jim Ash. Um, yes. Very good earlier, comment, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Very great. And, and, uh, uh, and the, the first comment was about uh, regional um, uh, progression, America's APAC and, and uh, EMEA. And again, what I would say there is, uh, um, is uh, yes, the, the beauty of the channel is once you crack the formula, you can really scale it up. But of course, and of course, I won't say the obvious, which is, you know, localize, um, you know, um, be culturally sensitive and all that. It's, it goes without saying. But uh, learn um, you know, if your startup organization is, uh, you know, get your homework done in your home turf. Make sure that you've really got a system that works, that you've defined your channel correctly, and that you have a system that works before going out and, and um, internationalizing, because that will just it will spread you too thin, and then you're going to hurt all over the place. That's, that's just my two cents on, on the subject. I'm going to add a little something on the on the previous question and, and the segue you made, Carlo, uh, when talking about that selection and topology of partners. This is uh, this is really important at the beginning uh, of the development of an ecosystem. And then what you're going to realize, uh, if you have a good level of retention in your own company and all that, is that there is going to be some relationship established between some of your, let's call them channel manager, but it could be, you know, somebody managing an alliance or something like this and a specific set of individuals. I'm not talking about the company anymore, but I'm talking about individuals. They are going to be working at a company, which is a partner of yours. And one day this individual or this set of individual individuals are going to leave that company and go work for another company, right? Guess what? This, this is where it sticks, right? If you treat well, let's say a sales guy uh, that works at worldwide and tomorrow he goes work for Sirius or something else or whatever, the, the first thing is gonna, if, if he believes in you and what you've been doing and was treated well, you have a good relationship and all that, the first thing he's gonna be doing uh, when he gets there is that, do we have that line? No, we don't have that vendor. Okay, we need to have it because I have a great person supporting me and that kind of stuff and we're gonna make book money doing this. And so on and so forth. So, so what Carlo was saying, it's a it's a people thing and all that, uh, beyond the strategy and all that, but something you absolutely have to think about the strategy. And if you remember this morning, Carlo, we talked about connectors when uh, uh, Tony was talking about connectors. It is really, really, really important that uh, you consider how you're going to deck your teams of people that are capable of creating those connections, nurturing them and maintaining them and fixing them when they need fixing, right? Because this is going to follow you all the time. People move from one company to another all the time. And you want them to think of you even after they moved away from the company where you started the relationship and, and, and keep yourself. I always tell people this, right? When, when you deal with a channel team, and remember what I said at the beginning, usually the relationship is between the channel manager and the partner. It is not between your company and the partner. It's between the channel manager and the partner because this is where the trust is established no matter what, right? And same way, you know, when that channel manager is going to go somewhere else, he's going to have an in into that partner no matter what he sells, right? If it's relevant to that company. But it's 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 really important. It's about the people. And that is something you need to think very clearly because we're talking about strategy today when you're going to build your strategy, 
right? What kind of people I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have in, in the staffing portion? And we, we provide a leave behind or your uh, gorilla is gonna provide information for each and every webinar we have. We have a, uh, um, uh, whatever, a document that, that supports what we do. And you'll see all of this will be there. But that's extremely important, that aspect of, but everybody knows that. Yeah, on, 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 on that, um, I, I think uh, a, a lot of companies when they design the channel strategy, they um, omit to really think sufficiently about what kind of resourcing structure you're going to need to support uh, to support that channel, and then and that's when it really hurts and it bites you uh, in the back and you, you lose face as a channel leader with uh, your own management because you you're not delivering. And I think uh, it, it it takes a lot more than one would think. So it's it's a difficult trade off because people go into the channel because why? For many reasons, obvious reasons, because of course the channel partners are already trusted advisors to to the customer. So you want to take that um, friendship and borrow it, if you like, right? But the other reason is because that way you don't have to hire ten thousand salespeople, because you don't, you can't afford to have ten thousand W two. So you're thinking, okay, I'm going to take a channel partner. They got twenty salespeople. Great, I'm going to hire them, and then you have many many channel partners. And then you think that all of these channel partners are going to be magically, <laughs> magically, um, you know, self uh, motivated, and um, they'll have a wonderful relationship all by themselves. No, it doesn't happen that way. You've got to really, really stay on top of it and plan ahead, and have the right kind of uh, coverage model, um, because that that goes into the discussion that we're not going to have the time to have, which is high touch, low touch coverage model for what partners does it need to be high touch and what partners does it need to be low touch and what does it really mean to be low touch but those things are really i think crucial and i i, I tend to be of the school that high touch is better than low touch um mm -hmm. yeah, provided that you're doing it correctly you get the results right of course there comes a point whereby it's no longer um it's no longer economical right but but that threshold is a lot lower than than is generally thought so um yeah so i would say uh plan, plan ahead Plan the resource. Don't only think about the market. Think about how you're going to run that channel. That's great. That's part, so, the, that's part of the list of things that are we consider to be mandatory or at least very important when you design your strategy, right? I mean, it's not like, oh, I'm going to throw a channel manager and he's going to do the whole thing. It, no, it, it's it's so much more extended than that, right? It's the biggest it's, point of failure in most uh, startups and some scale ups biggest point of failure they they hire a good channel leader or somebody that has those relationships in the channel and and that, that they expect ex the spending to stop there that's not the case that's just the start it's expensive running a channel correctly is expensive. Uh, but but that's how you scale up and that's how you grow into a grow, massive multinational it's so hard to do with without channel so is the money well spent yes sorry aaron go for it all right. Well, we got about uh, eight, seven, eight minutes left. So, uh, you know, we mentioned scalability a lot. So uh, I know we don't have uh, enough time to get into all of the elements of scalability, but uh, just, you know, we've all seen uh, channels scale too fast or not scale at the right time. Uh, so let's talk about some, uh, I'd like to hear about some key indicators on when to scale and when not to scale. Well, uh, it, so I mentioned something about capacity planning at the beginning and all that, and it, it's uh, it it all depends on the approach, right? It's uh, some companies are going to want to a certain extent to keep decking their channel team or their partnership team with more people and all that to be able to cover everything, but with more partners and more success and executing on a program that is successful or a set of programs that are successful and all that, there's going to there's gonna be many other issues that you're going to have, right? From quote to cash, uh, there's going to be a lot of things involving your finance department, your contracts department, your quotes, people and, and, and whatnot and all that. So my, my advice is to always keep the lines of communication open with uh, uh, one or two or maybe more, it depends how, how global you are, uh, distributors. Because one area where distributors can seriously alleviate your pains when you're scaling too fast is that, right? That, that problem is scaling too fast because they can absorb everything from quote to cash and many, many more things today uh, than what they used to do 10 or 20 years ago uh, 
uh, to prevent you from having to invest massively into headcounts and staffing and that kind of stuff, right? And uh, better for you if you keep that money for uh, uh, staffing some of your partners with champions and things of that nature, or even some of the distributors with that. Uh, so that that my thing is to say, you know, the indicators as to when you start uh, when you start stalling uh, in the quality the quality of your deliveries and all that is when you don't spend enough time with your partner, right? And when you're going to start having your channel manager that only show up at the end of the quarter to say, hey, what do you have in the pipe for me uh, to close this? That's not good. And, and no partners like to see their channel manager at the end of the quarter, obviously, right? Uh, think of the other 50 or 250 lines of product they have. If every channel manager would do that, uh, that they wouldn't be able to work. So they don't want that. And that's not, you know, that doesn't sound like a true good relationship. Uh, think of when turning around your quotes or that kind of stuff, if you're doing it by yourself for your partners, uh, suddenly takes from eight hours to 24 hours or 48 hours or a week or that kind of stuff. I right? think the same about your contracts with new partners, the onboarding, the trainings, all those type of things, where all those things start to delay. Uh, when your capability to give a demo is usually, no, I can before three weeks from now versus, yeah, we can do it tomorrow if you want. This is all indicators that you're scaling too fast or, or you're not scaling, actually. This is in, in indicators that you're growing too fast and you're not scaling properly to address that, right? So again, I'm a little biased with distribution. That's a world I've uh, I've lived in and I understand. That's a good way to do it. Right. But there can be other aspects of that where you're not going to be able to to suffice by yourself. Right. In the sense of, for example, partner marketing. Right. At the beginning, I, I've, I've seen zero so far a startup that have decked a position of partner marketing from the get go. Right. And suddenly you're going to have a ton of partners that are come to you and say, hey, let's do this event together or let's do something together. Or do you have a document to help me do this particular campaign where we're going to target a completely new vertical and, and, and so on and so forth? And you're not going to be able to provide in time. Well, distributor was a good one from code to cash and many other things that I mentioned for marketing their companies like Gorilla, for example. You can go to them and say, hey, can you guys help me with this particular campaign we're going to do or this particular program we want to launch and all that. And you're not going to add that to the plate of your people in marketing that already have a million things to do. You're going to contract an external company that's going to do it for a very reasonable amount of money, much less so than hiring somebody new in your company usually. Right. So there are ways to do it. Right. Uh, and, and the indicators as easy. Right. It's your 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 satisfaction, your partner satisfaction with you and your turnaround times on insert whatever subject you want to insert. Yeah. And uh, the, the only thing I would say is uh, in print, the principle really is walk, uh, crawl, crawl, walk, run. Right. Um, you know, uh, I, I think what's important is uh, is to be realistic. Uh, especially if you're uh, a younger company, a startup or a scale up. Scale up is already different, but startups, you know, don't expect to be taken by a big distributor from the outset. Don't even don't even bother. It's not worth the your, your waste of time, right? Also, don't expect to uh, to be able to sign up a, a global systems integrator. I have seen so many startups that have that expectation, and sometimes they pull it off. And if they do, it's a fluke, right? Um, so, you know, without wanting to rely on luck as a strategy, it's, uh, you should really, uh, you know, take it step by step and grow into that. Um, and ultimately even, even big companies struggle to, um, partner with very large systems integrators, not because they don't get the bandwidth necessarily because they're not necessarily a big enough name, but because it's very complex to work with a big uh, SI. So yes, uh, crawl, walk, run, Aaron. There we go. All right. So, um, do we have a last question? Is, do we have a how much time uh, do we have? Uh, uh, minute? Uh, partnerships yeah. As, yeah. So, last question here How do the panel see channel partnerships as well understood in general? It's a yes or no, I would think is, no. is uh, about the time we have for that. Okay. No. Uh, yeah, I'll go with that. Um, but uh, I, I note that uh, uh, that was a comment from Phil Blick, which I'm really interested in. Um, so uh, I look That's forward to one. chatting to Phil at some point in the future. Thank you. All right. So, 
Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, what a great discussion. The recording will be available on our website, uh, gorillaict.com under the events tab. Connect with us on LinkedIn where we promote a lot of these and join us uh, next month for the next webinar on the taxonomy of partners. So, is it, uh, is it, so yeah. Uh, Aaron, is it also available on the uh, LinkedIn page of uh, Gorilla? Or Correct. No? Okay, all right. So, all right. great Thank stuff. You, so really appreciate it, everyone. Mm -hmm.